be a long time. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Brianic, as pretty much everyone knows me here, but for those who don't, Chris Brianic. I work in the Marine Animal Disease Lab here at SOMOS uh, under Dr. Alam. Um, so today is my pleasure to introduce my friend and past collaborator, Dr. Jan Lavi. Dr. Jan Lavi is the New Jersey State Fish Pathologist, where he works under the Fish and Wildlife. Uh, fish and Wildlife is pretty much the equivalent of what we have here at, with the DEC. So Dr. Jan Lavi, or Jan, I'm just going to call him Jan. Uh, he graduated in 20, uh, 2008 from the Atlantic Veterinary College at University of Prince Edward Island in Canada. Uh, from there, he did two postdocs also in Canada. And since then, after fishing his two postdocs, working on just general fish health and fish immunology, a lot of really cool stuff there. Uh, he's been with New Jersey Fish and Wildlife for about 10 years now. In those 10 years, his primary responsibilities are conducting fish monitoring and fish research for both uh, wild fish throughout the state and hatchery racing fish, a lot of fish hatcheries uh, throughout New Jersey. Uh, Don's primary interests include generally fish health, like he likes a lot of fish health stuff, but in more uh, fine terms, he likes parasitology, immunology, uh, virology, bacteriology, and he knows a lot about all those things. I've asked a lot of random questions of him throughout the years here, and he's always had at least a glimpse of an answer, even for things completely like coming out of left field because I ask a lot of random questions sometimes. So thank you for that. Um, that's all right. Uh, okay. Of recent note here, Jan has recently discovered of local interest, has recently found a proposed pathogen causing the swimming, circling behavior in Menhaden around here that a lot of people have been describing around Long Island and New Jersey. So he's not talking about that today, but you can really pro prod, uh, prod him about that later because it's a really cool story and he kind of like solve the problem in a sense. Well, still needs some testing, but it's looking pretty likely. Now, um, Jan's worked on a lot of fish that a lot of people here have also worked on, including Manhattan, river herring, cutthroat, uh, cutthroat trout, um, blackfish, sticklebacks, just to name a few, but like seriously, knows a lot about fish, asked him a lot, went to veterinary college. He knows a lot. He also teaches some veterinary classes for um, uh, aqua health, right? Or I said aqua, that. aqua health, sorry. So, with that, I'm going to let him take over so he can have time to actually give this talk. And it should be a pretty cool one. So uh, it's all yours, John. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate the introduction. I'll take this off if that's okay yeah, with everybody. Yeah. I, right. I warned those the front row. All right. Good. Okay. I'll keep my distance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Appreciate that. Um, just to be clear, I did my PhD at the Atlantic Veterinary College as well, so I'm not a, a veterinarian, I'm a research scientist, that's my current position, so more of a science background than uh, like a clinical veterinary background. Um, so appreciate being here in person, nice to give these seminars again, and virtually, so hello everyone virtually as well. Um, I just wanted to give a little background first, to, so you guys can understand um, what we do and what roles that we serve. Um, so my office is a pretty small office, Fish and Wildlife, Health and Forensics, and that is a branch of the Division of Fish and Wildlife, which falls under the Department of Environmental Protection. So in our office, we, we actually um, are just one group that, that serves the entire state of New Jersey for fish and wildlife, health, and any mortality investigations. So we just um, statewide, we research infectious diseases, toxicologic issues, and we try to recommend practices to mitigate disease impacts. Um, so that in a nutshell is, is what our goals are in our office. And it's kind of an interesting role and position to be in because we have a lot of biologists, whether they're wildlife biologists, um, aquatics, um, between marine fisheries and freshwater fisheries that we actually interact with and we're able to learn more about um, aquatic animal health that way. So um, it's been a pleasure working with all these and collaborating with all these different biologists and scientists to, to kind of get to what my main interests are, which are in aquatic animal health. So just to show um, kind of where, where we are, we have two field labs in the state. This is my aquatic animal health lab. We've got a terrestrial wildlife health lab as well, which is on the top. Both of them are in North Jersey. Um, so, so we do all of our um, uh, research in there. We also uh, partner and work collaboratively with the Department of Agriculture. They have an animal health diagnostic lab. So that's where we do a lot of our molecular studies and everything like that. So um, in the end, we have a lot of access to good diagnostic tools to get, get our work done. 
So my interests and my my area is aquatic animal health. We have a wildlife veterinarian on staff as well that actually does all the terrestrial wildlife issues. Um, so, so in our aquatics program, um, Chris touched on it a little bit already. We do mortality investigations, diagnostics to understand what's killing uh, fish in the wild. We do surveillance for infectious diseases, so they don't always present themselves as mortality. So we'll do uh, surveillance alongside our biologists in their surveys. Um, we also oversee the health of our hatchery fish, so that's more on the freshwater side of things. Um, do annual health inspections with them and try to help them figure out disease issues and how to manage them. And then what I'm going to be talking about exclusively today is our marine fish health program and a couple projects that we've got ongoing with that. And just the last thing I put on there, just this year we're trying to support our Bureau of Shell Fisheries to do some pathogen monitoring. My background is almost exclusively in marine or in fin fish in general. Um, so this shellfish pathogen monitoring program is just something that we're trying to gear up the lab to just better support some surveillance that's done off the coast of New Jersey. So our marine fish health program, uh, just to overview that, we, we take a little bit of a different approach in our freshwater fisheries. We oftentimes just investigate mortality investigations, and that's how we know um, any disease issues with those populations. Marine systems, as you guys know, are so much more challenging because we've got an open ocean environment. If there are, if there's chronic morbidity or chronic uh, mortality, it often goes unnoticed just because they disperse so quickly. Um, they don't present themselves like a like a, a freshwater fish kill would in a small pond or in a small lake. So. So we take a bit of a different approach to that and we do a more active uh, fish health surveillance. And with that, we just team up with a, a lot of the surveys that our biologists are doing. The ocean trawl survey, which you guys should be very familiar with because it's actually the RV Seawolf that goes out for that. So that's actually a Stony Brook vessel that New Jersey Fish and Wildlife contracts with to get that work done. So that's the picture that you can see on the top right. Um, we work, work with our anadromous fisheries biologists, and then something I'll talk about today in this talk is our artificial reef survey, because we've been doing some really interesting work with black sea bass on that. Um, I'm going to be talking about parasites in this talk, but we're also surveying uh, for some important viruses. So we've got some genetic tools to be able to screen wild fish for viruses of concern, like viral hemorrhagic septicemia and viral nervous necrosis virus. So these are both active projects that we're working on. Uh, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we do in general. I'm going to focus on two projects that we're working on with parasite ecology and, and their parasites. I'm always really fond of parasites. They're the projects that excite me the most, so I wanted to talk about those. Um, so I apologize. The Menhaden stuff has been a huge project. We're making a lot of progress with these Menhaden kills and understanding the, the Vibrio bacterium that looks like it's responsible for it. I'm not going to talk about that, but happy to talk to anyone if you've got any, any questions about that after. So instead, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our projects on the ecology of parasites, and mostly parasites that have complex life cycles that use multiple hosts for transmission. Um, so a little background on parasite ecology on this. Um, sometimes we tend to think that just because there's a lot of parasites, that means that it must be a compromised system or something must be wrong, um, but that's not always the case. So if we look at some of these diverse environments like coral reef systems that that bring in a heavy interaction of a lot of invertebrates, a lot of different fish species together. That's where parasites actually thrive, especially complex parasites that need to transmit between uh, several different hosts. So, so um, when we look at ecology of parasites, you can have very good, healthy, thriving systems that actually have more diverse and more abundant parasite populations than, than other less uh, healthy looking systems. So can't always associate parasitism to a compromised environment, but as we'll see in the talk, there are definitely situations where um, there's some changes to an environment that can kind of push in the favor of parasites where we might start thinking that disease can become an issue. So um, the two projects I'm going to talk about, um, one is a river herring project, so our anadromous fisheries biologists uh, study river herring, they're a declining species, so one that we want to learn more about. We identified a mixosome and parasite in these that we want to learn more about. So that'll be the first thing I kind of uh, talk about and tell you where we're at so far. And then the second parasite model that we're looking at are pinellid copepods and specifically anchor worms. So if a lot of you guys are working in with marine fin fish, the chances are you've probably seen this copepod on the skin of the fish. So I'll talk a little bit about work that we've done to try to elucidate the life cycle, the host preferences of that parasite, and how habitat might influence the abundance of that parasite in the environment. 
So just to kick off our river herring project, a uh, quick note where a lot of you might already be familiar with this, but river herring life history, these are anadromous fish that, that are native pretty much from Nova Scotia all the way down to Florida. They're, they they are, um, used to be quite abundant here, but they, they've been seeing a decline. So these are fish that spend most of the time in the ocean. They're marine fish, and then they migrate into the rivers for spawning. And based on our biologist surveys, it's around March that they start entering the rivers to spawn, and that, that goes between March and May, really. So the adults come into the rivers to spawn. Once spawning's done, they return to the ocean. And then the young of the year fish that are in there actually use the river environment as a nursery. And they stay in the river for about five months where they then start to emigrate to the estuaries. And then eventually as they get bigger, they, they migrate out into the ocean, generally in the first year out there. So the river herring project that our biologists do, they actually have surveys for monitoring um, how many spawning fish are coming back. That's the gill net survey that you see in that middle picture on the right. So, um, and then they also do a beach survey where they're looking at young of the year uh, fish coming in. So they're looking at both um, how many adults are returning and then the, the young of the year, how well the fish are hatching and, and how abundant they are. So we talked about these fish as declining. Uh, there's a number of factors that are attributing to that. And probably the biggest one are, since these are anadromous fish, uh, damming of rivers is one of the things. So they, they lose access to their spawning grounds that way. And I think that's one of the leading hypotheses on why we've seen such a decline with river herring populations is just that loss of spawning habitat from, from damming. Um, historical overfishing is another issue. Climate change is another one that, that's being looked into and pollution are all potential factors on why some of these populations might not be recovering, um, even though there's been a moratorium in place for them. So I'm gonna specifically talk about some findings that we've found in the young of the year river herring. So these are the river herring that are spending five months in the river kind of the nursery stage before they go out into the saltwater environment. So we, we've discovered a mixozoan parasite that, that could be kind of problematic for young of the year fish. And I just want to give a quick overview on what mixozoan parasites are. They're fascinating parasites. And I should tell you probably both of these parasite models, um, it's almost like out of a science fiction movie or something like the life cycles that they go through and, and how they um, adjusted and the tropisms that they go into fish are really quite unique. So definitely a, a long process of evolution with the fish to get to where they are. So mixozoan parasites, if you're not familiar, these are actually cnidarians. So cnidarians, which are like jellyfish, these have evolved parasitism towards fish and they, they have a two host life cycle. So they actually alternate between fish and an annelid host. So it's pretty fascinating that, that an organism like an Iderian will, will kind of evolve into this pathway to become parasitic and, and cycle between two different hosts like that. And if you look at some of the pictures here, this is what mixozoan parasites look like. There are these uh, microscopic spores and they have polar capsules in them. Each of those polar capsules has a coiled polar filament in it. And these are really similar to the uh, nematocytes or the nidocytes of jellyfish. So those are the stinging cells. So when a jellyfish stings, you got these sort of capsules with this filament, the filament comes out, releases the toxin, and that's, that's the stinging cell. So interestingly with mixozoans, they've retained that sort of structure with these um, similar to stinging cells, but they don't actually sting. They avert the polar filament, they attach to a host, whether that's a, um, a annelid host or a fish. And after attachment, they eject the sporoplasm, which then infects the fish. So, so they've kind of evolved to use what used to be a stinging cell into an infection apparatus to actually get into um, either fish or the annelid hosts. So there's two stages in the life cycle. Um, this is just showing some sketches by Yuzhi Lohm and Iva Dikova. Uh, these are actinospores, which is one stage of the life cycle. And then mixospores is another stage of the life cycle. And the only thing to get out of that image there is that the two stages look really different from each other. And one of the challenges that um, biologists have had in working with mixozoans is trying to line up what stage goes with what. So, so these actinospores are ones that are produced in annelid hosts, and these are mixospores produced in fish hosts. So originally they thought these were actually separate parasites from each other, and genetics has allowed us to actually be able to match some of these parasites and, and understand that it's part of uh, one life cycle that's alternating between these annelids and fish hosts. 
So jumping into what we discovered in Young of the Year fish, we were doing a general uh, screening to look at any kind of pathogens or diseases in river herring. And these were young fish, just a couple months old. And something that we were coming across is um, deformations in the ribs and in the bones of the fish. So in this picture right here, what you're actually looking at is this is the body wall of one of the Young of the Year river herring. These are rib bones that are coming down here. So what we saw were these massive cysts within the rib. So this is actually a cyst uh, and we lose the rest of the rib after. Um, so that's kind of an extreme case, but we're also seeing what should be rib bones that are nice and thin like this all the way throughout. We see these uh, cystic formations within the rib. So these are cysts. We see proliferation of the cartilage in the rib. So we get these really strange growths coming out of the rib bones. Um, so what we found when we looked into those cysts and into the bones were that they were cysts full of mixozoan parasites. So it's a mixobolus species that actually has a tropism for the cartilage. It infects the inside um, of the bone, so the central part of the bone of the rib. And at the end of its um, proliferative cycle, it, it actually breaks the rib bone or lyses the bone and releases those spores uh, into the skin, into the muscle, which causes more inflammation. So um, this was a parasite that we thought could be pathogenic just because it's actually breaking the rib bones of the fish uh, as it's going. And it did elicit quite a bit of pathology. So it's one we wanted to learn more about. Uh, I do histopathology in the lab, so it's something that, that I'm interested in, and we actually use histology as a way of assessing virulence or how pathogenic some of these parasites might be. Um, but these are really interesting pictures. Let me use this other pointer. Um, what you're looking at right here is this is the body wall of a young river herring. So this is muscle right here. And right here, we're uh, looking at a rib. So this is one of the rib bones, this pink on the outside that I'm outlining. Um, is ossified bone and inside are chondrocytes uh, and cartilage. And here you can actually see cysts of parasites in here, which are actually lysing this rib bone. We lose that ossification of the rib. Um, it's thought that mixozoan parasites do produce some kind of toxins that can degrade cartilage and degrade bone. So at this point, it's probably degrading the bone. And at this point, it's lysing and breaking that rib bone. And here we're just looking at a more advanced lesion where again, we lose that ossification of the bone. We've got this sort of uh, proliferative um, cartilage growth that's happening in there. Uh, so it's, it's actually breaking the bones of the fish. And these are two, three month old fish that we're talking about. Um, and obviously for the life cycle of the parasite, those mixospores wanna get into the environment to get infect the analyte host to sort of perpetuate that life cycle. So I'm not going to get into the details of this, but where we took this, this was an undescribed species. So it was a novel binding. We did a full species description to identify it with sketches of what the mixospores look like. Did some phylogenetics to understand uh, where, where it actually belongs. And we named it Mixopolis moriensis. Uh, that's after the Morris River where we actually discovered uh, this parasite initially. Um, interestingly, it, the 18S ribosomal DNA, which is a pretty conserved uh, gene, it was actually quite different from every other Mixobolus species out there. The closest relative was 83% similar, which is actually quite diverse in this conserved gene, the 18S ribosomal RNA gene. So it's kind of interesting. Um, it did actually uh, fit with some other marine Mixobolus species that had a tropism for cartilage though. So it, it did group with those other parasites. So we went from describing this parasite for the first time, naming it to, we wanted to find a good screening, a way to screen these fish for these infections to understand if it's actually a problem, if we see a high prevalence of this in rivers. Um, so it can be pretty simple. We can dissect young of the year pairing and pretty much we're screening their rib bones for any cystic growth that we're confirming if there's any cysts in the, or any breaks in the bones that there's actually a mix of spores present in there. Uh, so doing that, we're able to evaluate uh, hundreds of young of the year fish from these three different river systems that you see on that map. And um, one of the findings that we saw are young of the year fish in the Delaware River were really rarely infected. Um, but when we looked at the Morris River populations, which are right down here, we actually saw a 20% prevalence in all the fish that we looked at out there. So really high prevalence of this parasite in that system. Um, even in the Great Egg Harbor River, which is pretty close by, uh, relatively low prevalence compared to the Morris River. Uh, with 
So one of our big questions now is we've got this parasite that we think could be affecting young of the year populations of river herring. And now we have one river system that seems to be really more impacted by it than other ones. So we wanna understand that a bit better. Um, so I think what this comes down to are the annelid hosts or the oligochaetes, which we currently don't know what that is for Mixobolus moriensis. Um, it might be better supported and there might be heavier populations in that Morris River system for, for whatever reason. Um, oligochaetes, which are common hosts for these, they can be in uh, areas that have a lot of nutrient load, uh, pollution, a lot of silt. So it's possible that the Morris River is just one that supports this annelid host, this oligochaete host a little bit better. So if we kind of look at it, it's pretty interesting to look at what the life cycle of this parasite would be because these young of the year fish are only present in the river for about five months out of the year. So for this parasite to be successful at transmitting, it actually needs to create spores for next year's young of the year fish that come into the river since um, they're only in there for a short time. So what we think is happening here is in May and June, when these fish are just a month or two old, they're being affected by this parasite and all the way through September is this uh, pre-patent period or this incubation period for these mix of spores to develop. When they develop, they either through mortality of the fish, through predation of the fish, um, if fish are infected fish are eaten by a predator, those spores can actually survive the digestive tract and be um, shed into the environment that way as well. So for this parasite to be successful though, it needs to shed into that river environment before those fish leave for the ocean. Because once they get to the ocean, that parasite's not gonna be successful. So we think that this mix of spore shedding is occurring in July to October, and it's getting into these annelid populations or these oligarchy populations that we still have not um, figured out what they are at this point. So, and then those, that next stage of the life cycle incubates in that through the winter, all the way to the following spring when next year's thing of the year fish come in, and then these actinospores would be shed and, and infect next year's uh, fish. So it's more of an annual cycle that we see with this. So I think the most important steps that we're taking um, is where we wanna find out what this oligochaete host is or what this analid host is that's supporting uh, these, these parasites and replicating them. Um, so that is going into the Morris River. We know that's the river that seems to be most impacted. Looking at sediment samples, looking for the, the variety of oligochaetes, screening them under the microscope, and using genetics to both identify the oligochaetes and to see if they have this parasite present in them. Um, we've got a, a really keen student right now, Nilanjana Das. She started with me, oh, I think it's been like six months that she started now really interested in mixozoans. So she's actually spending a lot of time on the river taking sediment samples, looking for um, oligochaetes and trying to screen them for this parasite. So she's pretty enthusiastic about it. She's actually leaving the lab in, by the next summer, she's gonna be going to Oregon State University to do a, a graduate work with uh, mixozoans. So um, I'm relying on her. She's gonna hopefully try to get this um, figured out which oligochaete um, is supporting this replication. So that's really, probably the most important next step of kind of where we are with that project right now. Um, we're also thinking about using eDNA. We now have the genetic genetics of this parasite so we can develop a quantitative PCR to detect it out of water samples. So we can take multiple water samples from the river and look for parasite DNA in there to help us track where, where the biggest shedding rates are, where this oligochaete might be. So that's, that's one project on, on a really fascinating parasite. This other one I wanted to present to you guys because I know a lot of you work with marine finfish and I'm sure that you have come across Lernianicus radiatus, which is um, anchorworm as the common name is. Um, we've done a lot of work to try to um, elucidate the life cycle of this, try to understand um, how habitat and host preferences can lead to abundance of the parasite. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some work that we're doing with that. So something that you are probably familiar seeing, I think used to use this laser pointer, or anyone that works with Atlantic menhaden or similar species is seeing these sort of worms that are sticking out the side of the fish. Um, and what you're seeing here is sort of like a neck and abdomen and some egg strands that are coming off of that. So they call it anchor worm, but it, it actually is a copepod parasite. And those are female parasites that you're actually looking at. And I think there's been a lot of focus, and this is a very apparent stage right here, 
but it hasn't always been apparent on how we get to that point. So something that we've been looking at are the early stages of the life cycle of this anchor worm. And um, we were actually finding these uh, early stages of Larnianicus radiatus, which is a copepod that's about one to two millimeters in size, so really tiny. And it's actually found in the gills of black sea bass. So here you can see, here's some gills of black sea bass everywhere where you can see those sort of uh, dark pigmentation or where the parasites are attached to the gill. So this has a two host life cycle and both hosts are actually fin fish. And it seems to go between different fish species. It goes from black sea bass to, to other fish as well. So it is a really interesting life cycle. We spent a lot of time looking at this parasite in black sea bass. So um, this is the developmental cycle that, that we proposed for uh, Larnianicus radiatus. So we just have a little sketch that we've made that I made with that. Um, it's like any other kind of crustacean. You have nauplier stages that are sort of free swimming in the water. The first uh, infectious stage to fish is a copepodid stage that actually infects the gills of the black sea bass. And then there's four calamus stages. Um, each stage has a molt in between. And then you have mature males and females. And these females are larger. They have this large abdominal segment. And then this is a, a male parasite right here. Um, like I said, these are really tiny copepods. They're, uh, males are probably about one millimeter, females can be like three millimeters, and then quite a bit longer as this um, uh, genital segment actually expands. One of the interesting things that I wanted to know is how specific, so we, we always have specialist parasites or parasites that are uh, generalists that might infect a lot of different hosts. I was curious to know if these parasites can develop in other species or if it seems to be specific to black sea bass. So we were able to collect a lot of samples from the ocean trawl survey from the RBC wool and from other surveys that our biologists have been doing. And pretty much we looked at the exact areas where we're seeing a high abundance of this in black sea bass. Um, we looked at over 500 specimens representing 18 species from that same habitat. And we never found a single fish that was able to um, complete the life cycle uh, to this point, uh, like it does in black sea bass. So, so we've found that this is a specialist parasite at this point. It infects only black sea bass in our area. So it needs to go through black sea bass before it completes its life cycle into another fish host like the Menhaden. Um, and I think that was a really uh, important finding to understanding the ecology of this parasite because probably the abundance of this parasite is going to be tied to black sea bass populations, seeing as that they are required for the life cycle to be completed here. So we did quite a bit of morphological work with this parasite to characterize it. It hasn't really been characterized in black sea bass gills. And we were seeing some infections that were quite heavy. So we wanted to understand how that affected the gill pathology of the fish as well. Um, here, we're looking at a, a calamus stage of Larnianicus radiatus. This is gill tissue. They actually uh, form a really unique tubular appendage that penetrates the gill tissue and actually adheres itself to the cartilage of the gill filament. Um, so that's a really unique infection apparatus that hasn't been described for any penelid parasite. They usually just have these little frontal filaments and they embed into the epithelium and that's it. So this is a really robust attachment apparatus and um, you can see in histology, it penetrates the gill and it actually adheres to the gill cartilage. And the advantage for that might be that it's just a really secure attachment. If this is an active fish swimming around, then that's going to really secure it to the gill tissue so it doesn't go anywhere. But one of the negatives for the fish is that this is quite invasive to the gill tissue and it elicits some pretty heavy pathology. This is a gill filament right here. You can see the multiple parasites that are attached. If you look closely, you can see these little tubular appendages that are actually penetrating the gill tissue and adhering to that um, gill cartilage. So we did some histology studies to look at the morphology of this appendage, which was um, pretty significant. It, it, it was multiple layers. We did some special staining uh, with a Luna stain. So we see that this is a chitinous structure. So that tubular appendage is, is mostly composed of chitin when it's uh, attaching to the fish. So here you can see some histology um, and where, where I think it's more important for, for this species, Larnianicus radiatus, is that that attachment does elicit quite a bit more pathology. Here's a really interesting tissue section where we can see a section of the parasite right here. And this is the gill that it's infecting. 
this is a tubular appendage that's actually penetrating through the epithelium. It's breaking the basement membrane and going into the, the primary filament where it's adhering to the, to the cartilage. So in this bottom picture, you can see it is actually compromising the surface of the gill. It's causing this lamellar fusion, we call it. Um, so you're reducing your surface area of the gill as a response to this parasite. And when I start showing you some of the infection intensities, we'll see it and you can see how this can actually probably attribute to compromising the um, function of the gills. So quickly, for those of you that might not be familiar, gills are really a multifunctional organ in fish. They, they, we know them, that they're required for respiration. They get all their oxygen exchange that way, but they do much more than that. They're also an osmoregulatory organ. So they're pumping ions in and out. So when you're reducing that surface, you're, you're limiting the ability of them to osmoregulate. Um, and it's also an excretory organ. So they excrete most of their ammonia through their gills. Um, so, so we're not just talking about a respiratory organ, it's an osmoregulatory organ, uh, an excretory organ, and a respiratory organ. So when you have a dysfunction in that, that, that can lead to some um, bad physiological consequences for the fish. So everything I've been describing here in the black sea bass, this is the first host in the life cycle of this parasite. And we mentioned the females will actually drop off the black sea bass once um, sexual reproduction has occurred. And they will go into this incredible metamorphosis, which uh, pinellid parasites are known to do. So females metamorphose into something that's completely unrecognizable from their initial stage. And I put this picture together, which is actually right in uh, size. It's the right relative size. So this arrow is pointing to one of the gill stages of the females that are dropping off the gill. And then this is the metamorphosed female right here that actually you'll see in Menhaden populations or other marine finfish populations. You get this uh, horn structure, you get the neck of the parasite, you have the abdomen, and then extrans that come out of there. So females will drop off the black sea bass, they will find another host, and they will get a meal to support egg development uh, and obviously um, supporting more parasites, not later stages that have had the eggs to, to infect other black sea bass. So this is probably more what you might recognize with anchor worm. This is in uh, Atlantic Menhaden, where we can see the, the worm. Well, I call them worms because we call them anchor worms, actually copepods. The copepods will penetrate the skin. They bury that um, horn structure deep into the muscle, and there, that's where they get their, their meal to support egg development. Um, we did some prevalence studies of Menhaden in three different areas off the coast of New Jersey, and we're just seeing really heavy um, infection intensities in that central area, which were actually seven to nine times higher than like rare than Delaware Bays. So there seems to be a high parasite prevalence here. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into that and in what we're seeing with black sea bass. So the, the early stage of black sea bass, the parasite is a specialist. It requires a black sea bass to complete its life cycle. These metamorphosed females can actually go into a variety of finfish hosts. They don't go into just Menhaden. They seem to be Menhaden are a preferred host, but this is a summer flounder. It's a naked goby, Atlantic herring. We documented it in like seven different species, but I think overall there's like 16 or 17 different marine fish species that, that the females can metamorphose in. So more of a generalist parasite when it gets to that point, they can use a lot of different hosts. And really fascinating morphology for these. Um, we were looking at the attachment of these copepods into the muscle of Menhaden. And all you're looking at here is this, these are the horns, or some people call them antlers, which kind of looks right. They look like an ant, antler like um, structure. That's like the head of the parasite. It burrows deeply into the muscle, forms that sort of anchor, and then it's stuck into um, the fish, and it's really hard to dislodge. It's even difficult for us when we're doing necropsies on these to actually um, unbury those structures intact without breaking them. Uh, so, so this is how the parasite looks. I mentioned with the neck, the abdomen um, can cause pretty serious ulcerations in some marine fin fish as well. Uh, so one of our important observations that we made is that the method of attachment that this parasite makes and the size of the fish that it infects directly corresponds to the morphology of that metamorphosed female, which was uh, something that was really unexpected. So when we saw 
these metamorphosed females in young of the year hosts or in smaller fish, the parasites were smaller. They had a smaller neck, but they also didn't anchor into the muscle of the fish. They found bone and they adhered themselves to bone. And because of that, they lost all of those radiating horns on the head. So if you notice before we had all those uh, horns coming out or the antlers, these are some from young of the year silver perch. And you can see that these were just stuck and adhered to bone and they don't have horns. If they do have horns, they're really small compared to um, what we saw in the Atlantic Manhattan. Uh, so this is a, a silver perch where parasite actually invaded the gill filament and anchored its process right here, um, right within the gill cartilage. So we thought this was a different species, that it wasn't Lernianicus radiatus because it was like three times smaller than the other one. It didn't have any of those radiating horns. So it just looked totally different. And in the literature, this is described as Lernianicus affixus because of the way that it affixes the bone and cartilage. So we did the genetics on that though, and it was 100% identical to Lernianicus radiatus. So we actually confirmed that although this metamorphosed female looks completely different, it actually is the same as what we see in Menhaden. And it's actually just a response uh, to the host that it's infecting. So if it's infecting a small host, it doesn't need to penetrate as deep into the muscles. So it doesn't need as long of a neck if it needs to use bone to adhere to. It doesn't develop horns, instead it affixes to it. So it's really fascinating because there's a lot of plasticity to what these stages could look like. And it's mostly driven by the hosts that they're actually infecting. And you can imagine the, the difficulty that's created because when you look back at the literature, taxonomists, taxonomists have used the morphology of what these metamorphosed females look like to speciate them. So here we have, for example, Lernianicus affixus, which we um, would propose to abolish that because it's actually Lernianicus radiatus. So, so genetics is super important to try to understand this parasite um, and, and going into the literature, anything that uses metamorphosed females as their taxonomic criteria um, needs to be interpreted really cautiously based on what we're seeing here. So just to summarize, we, we figured out some of these host factors that are necessary to perpetuate anchor worm in the environment. Black sea bass, this is critical, black sea bass are necessary for parasite development. So black sea bass are gonna be a big driver for if we're seeing a lot of anchor worm or not. We have not seen this parasite be able to complete its life cycle in another host in this area at least. Um, and although the metamorphosis can occur in a lot of different fish species, Atlantic menhaden and bay anchovies seem to be the preferred hosts. We see that happening, um, occurring in those species the most. So our next research question was, um, how does habitat sort of impact the incidence of this parasite? So we looked at, we see that it, it likes to use these hosts. Now, how about looking at a couple different habitats that we've got in New Jersey? So we've got, if you look at the habitat, it's probably similar out here. It's a very sandy plain, um, very little structure in the habitat off the coast of New Jersey. So not much structure for bottom dwelling uh, fish. And that, that's really the reason that this artificial reef program has been supported. So our Division of Fish and Wildlife or Marine Biologists put a lot of effort into um, making these artificial reefs in New Jersey. So since 1984, there's been 17 artificial reef sites that they put out. And this ranges from rocks, concrete, tanks, ships, subway cars that are sunk, um, anything. So they obviously they go through them to make sure that they are um, not gonna be polluting the environment. And then they will sink these to make structure on the bottom and create these sort of artificial reefs to support uh, fish populations and invertebrates and everything. So you can find this on our website. This is actually a map of New Jersey and all the artificial reefs that are on the coast. So um, these reef habitats are really beneficial to demersal fishes, and especially black sea bass and tautog. They like uh, bottom structure. These are just some pictures. This is part of a subway car here. And you can see how quickly, like you wouldn't even recognize that as a subway car. It just gets completely encrusted in, in vertebrates. Um, and some of the studies that they've done, 85% of the biomass on these is muscles, barnacles, anemones, bryzoans, hydroids, tube worms, and coral that get, goes on there. But pretty quickly, these tanks, subway cars, whatever it is, they get colonized by these invertebrates and create this really unique habitat. So it's good for the fish, and it's also good for scuba divers, where we've got all of the reefs actually um, 
on a map and they can actually dive some of these spots, look at the fish and look at the restructures down there. So it's been a really successful, really cool program that Fish and Wildlife has been running. Uh, so this is a short video of an ROV looking at this. This is really cool because it's actually, you're looking at a sunken tank. Um, and this was just in the water for a few years. And in the video, you can just see how quickly that tank has been encrusted in marine life. Um, looking at it, you'll see probably a lot of cunner fish, some Nigerian flying by there, um, but really supports a lot of black sea bass. So you can see the currents coming towards us on the backside of that tank. Once the ROV gets over there, you'll see all the black sea bass. You'll see a great trigger fish come up here in the video right there. It's a little spooked by the camera, it looks like. Um, this larger fish that I can't identify, but a lot of what you're seeing there are black sea bass and they're just attracted to having some kind of substrate on the bottom. So it, it seems to be really successful at supporting these black sea bass populations. There you can see on the back side of it, those are mostly hunter and black sea bass that are out there. It's a really cool video to see like what these um, reefs actually look like down there. So with our reef biologists were able to design a really interesting study to compare habitat. So I mentioned that sandy bottom non-structure habitat, we can collect sea bass from that area. And then we can collect sea bass from the artificial reefs to compare parasite prevalence to see if one habitat supports more of these parasites than another. Um, and again, there's already sea wolf that uh, we took all of our ocean trawl samples from that. We were able to um, develop a method to estimate parasite counts in the gills of fish. So we were able to look at how many copepods are in, in a, each fish. Um, and just to tell you, we, we did about 60 fish where we counted every parasite in the fish. And then we were able to come up with a formula where we can just count the first two gill arches and then get an estimation for the rest of it. Extremely time consuming to count every parasite in the fish. And I can tell you the heaviest infected fish was about 22,000 parasites. So they're not small numbers that we're talking about for estimating these infection intensities. So um, we're able to get parasite counts per fish. We're comparing non-reef non sites to reef sites to see if we see any differences in Lernianicus radiatus and the gills of black sea bass. And we did see some really interesting results with this. Um, when, we, when we compared them, both of the reef sites that we looked at. This was Little Egg Harbor Reef and Seagirt Reef. Um, and then these are ocean trawl sample sites right here. And on the y-axis, you're seeing mean parasite counts. So we saw very significant differences in reef sites compared to the non-reef site in that fish were heavier infected on the reefs in both of these instances than they were in the non-reef site. Um, some of the reef fish had about 5,000 copepods per fish. And like I mentioned, they got quite a bit heavier sometime. So we were able to model that and looked at it with a linear regression and that develops sort of an odds ratio where we can see, and pretty much it tells us that reef fish had about two to three and a half, 3.7 times higher incidence of Lernianicus radiatus than when fish were taken from like the non-structure habitat. So we were definitely seeing a difference in parasite prevalence between reefs and non-reefs. And it kind of makes sense, right? It goes to the first slide that I showed you guys. Reefs are biodiverse environments. They bring together a lot of different species. There's abundance there. And parasites love that, right? They need hosts. They need diversity to complete their life cycle. So we think that that's one of the big drivers behind this. Um, we were also interested in looking at relative condition factor of the black sea bass, just to see if parasitism had any impact at all on relative condition of the black sea bass. And just to go through this pretty quickly, we saw a, a big difference between summer and fall samples, which makes sense. Um, fish are feeding through the summer. They get into their best condition in the fall before overwintering. So, so this sort of trend of better condition factors in the fall made sense. And when we tried to graph that um, to see if there was an association of numbers of parasites and condition factor, we actually did not see a difference. So fish that were heavily infected with parasites still had pretty decent conditions. We, we didn't think at least in the sample size that we looked at, this is it plotted. You'd expect to see kind of a line going down like this if you expected to see a, a difference there. And, and we didn't see uh, low condition factors related to parasitism. So the biologists always ask, well, what's this mean? Um, what are the ecological impacts of this? What's it mean for our fisheries? What's it mean about artificial reefs and everything? And 
And those are always the challenging questions in the end. And in my mind, there's multiple ecological perspectives that we can look at this. Um, and it's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And we can look at all three of those um, and, and weigh them that way. So just to go through some of the good of why we might be seeing such heavy uh, parasite infections in black sea bass and such a high abundance of anchor worm is that the two hosts that we know, it requires a black sea bass as a host and it's preferred host is an Atlantic menhaden. These are two species that are doing really well right now. The abundance of these are both up. So we can look at, this is the uh, spawning stock biomass of black sea bass right here. In the past 10 years, we've seen a huge spike. So black sea bass populations have been doing great. Um, and then on the Atlantic menhaden side, since 2013, more restrictions have been put on quotas for um, Atlantic menhaden for the fishery. And there's been reduced harvest, really important fish species for predators like striped bass and everything. So really important in the ecology of the system. So their quotas have been reduced. So we're looking at very good populations of menhaden and black sea bass. And that's great news for this parasite, right? Those are the two hosts that it actually likes going through. So, um, so what's the good in this? I think that we're seeing these heavy parasite um, infections as a result of these two fish species doing very well right now. Um, we mentioned before artificial reefs provide habitat for invertebrates, diverse fish species, but they might also be bringing in closer interactions of fish that normally wouldn't be happening in like an open plain environment. Uh, like where we weren't seeing as heavy of an infection. So, and that's definitely been some of the biologists' observations. They showed you the video, where there's black sea bass that, that are really abundant in these areas. And they also uh, see schools of menhaden that are pretty close in proximity to these reefs. So it's possible, well, these reefs are successful in increasing the abundance and, and attracting um, both of these fish species, but it's also beneficial for the parasite because it's bringing these hosts, preferred hosts, into close contact with each other, um, which kind of leads to an interesting point that, that maybe Lernianicus radiatus can be used as an indicator for species interactions between menhaden and black sea bass, and their high intensity and prevalence may be an indication that both of these species are doing well. I'd be really interested to see in those years where menhaden populations are down or when the years where black sea bass are doing really poorly, be really interested to see what the parasite infection intensities and prevalence is compared to right now, which is kind of a high for them. So of course, we look at the good, we, we can't ignore the bad, right? So we're seeing really heavy infection intensities in some of these fish. 11% of all the black sea bass we sampled from these artificial reefs were heavily infected with a parasite, which we, we classed as having over 5,000 copepods per fish. 5% of those fish were what I'll call hyperinfected, um, 10,000 or more copepods per fish. And I mentioned to you already the highest we've seen were a couple that had over 20,000 parasites in there. Uh, so this has to have some impact in the fish gills, right? So these are some gill filaments that I cut out of some of the heavily infected black sea bass. And you can see that they are just loaded with parasites, really heavy infection burden. Um, and here again, this is just gill tissue right here, completely covered in these copepods. And you saw the images before, they had this invasive attachment um, tubular appendage that attaches to gill, which, which makes it actually more pathogenic to the fish as well. So this is in histology, um, comparing what a normal gill looks like to what an infected gill looks like when the copepod is on there. And with gills, you have a, a gill filament that comes up and all of these are lamellae. And those lamellae increase the respiratory surface, that osmoregulatory surface and everything. So surface area is really important for this organ. And you can see in a fish that's heavily infected with those copepods, these are all sections of the copepods right here. But you can see those individual lamellae are all lost. We have a lot of lamellar fusion, uh, very, very significant reduction of that surface area of the gill in those fish. So very compromised gills, it would appear from histology. So the interesting thing is in all these surveys, no fish are showing any disease signs. They are apparently healthy fish when we're sampling them, even though we're seeing this heavy parasite burden. Um, so it seems like, and with fish in general, they have a remarkable um, capability to withstand damage, whether it's organ damage, gill damage. When everything in the environment is great, dissolved oxygen is very high and um, the metabolic scope is normal or low in the fish, the fish are probably doing fine, even with all these parasites on there. 
But something that we need to think about is if those fish are subject to any kind of stressors, if the dissolved oxygen gets lower, or um, if they're stressors or they need to use high uh, metabolic scope, like if they're migrating, then that might be compromised when they have that, that much gill damage in there. So, so we always look at um, understanding disease as this sort of triad of understanding the pathogen, the host, environmental factors, and when they align a certain way, that's when there would be disease in them. So, so although we're not seeing outright disease in these fish, it's pretty obvious that their gills are compromised and that potential stressors might impact the way that they can withstand them. So I think it's something important to, to understand a little bit more about. And of course, we're gonna talk about the good and the bad, the ugly. That's lesions that you guys are probably seeing when you're working with these marine fish populations. So when we have more of these parasites, you expect to see more of these um, ulcers in the fish skin. You get these copepods or worm-like stages that hang off of them, um, causes damage to the muscle. So manhattan's more of a reduction fishery. So not a lot of people are eating them, but I showed you before, summer flounder, bluefish, other fish are also impacted by it. So, so that's kind of the, the ugly side of that. So just to bring everything all together and my last slide here to conclude with parasite ecology, um, parasites are common. They're common in all fish. They're often not lethal. You see a huge diversity of parasites in there. Um, but then there's, there's some that you have to think about if they hit a certain uh, abundance level that maybe they'll, they'll have some physiological impact. So we have to try to understand what is sort of background like normal, healthy, symbiotic relationships between parasites and their fish versus ones where environmental factors might be tipping the, the scale towards them being a bit more abundant and pathogenic in fish. So um, we see the abundance of parasites that have comp complex life cycles are dependent on a lot of ecological factors that are the prevalence of their hosts and, and other environmental things. So we talked about the Mixobolus species, so what kind of impacts do dams have on the presence of oligochaetes in an environment that support that parasite that causes the rib breaks in the river area? Um, and then other environments, things like reefs that bring closer species interactions, we can see higher parasite incidents with Lernianicus radiatus or anchor worms. So, so I think they're, they're really interesting ecological questions on the disease side of this. So, so we know parasites are part of the, the normal um, flora fish out there, but when is that balance kind of tipped in the favor of parasites where they could be impacting um, either chronically or even more um, acutely in these populations? So they're interesting questions that I think would be answered by collaboration of ecologists, pathologists, and, and a lot of different fields that can be brought together into this sort of research. So I think I stayed pretty well on time, which is rare for me. So. <laughs> um, but I want to acknowledge um, everyone that was involved that helped with the study with this. Um, our funding is actually uh, federal funds that we get from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Sport Fish Restoration Grants. So I got two grants to do this sort of work. Um, so definitely acknowledge the funding there, everyone that's involved with it. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys got some. I'm wondering uh, what, the, what the defense mechanisms might be of the fish and also what might prey on the parasites themselves and at which stages. Yeah, the defense mechanisms to avoid for, for general parasites or for, for, for anchor worm. Yeah. Yeah. So the defense, it, it seems like those parasites are pretty successfully invading the gills. Um, my guess is that anchor worm is a specialist with black sea bass because it's such an intricate infection apparatus. It forms that tubular structure, it penetrates the gill. Um, it might even have some immune modulators to be able to get to that point. Um, so, so there's probably an interesting question that needs to be answered of why it goes only in black sea bass and not any other fish species. Presumably, the parasite has found a way to maybe evade the immune response a bit better or to more successfully um, infect black sea bass than other fish species. So I think that there are some immune modulators that, that could go into play with that. Um, seeing the, the infections with learning Anticus radiatus and black sea bass, I'm wondering how effective any kind of immune response is to it just to receive such heavy infections, um, unless there, there is some stressor involved for them to, to infect there. But yeah, there's, 
I won't be able to answer that question because that, that probably would require some ex experimental work to know that a bit better. But definitely, there's got to be some immunological factors involved with it. There's a second part to your question. That I can't uh, remember. What stages of the parasite's life cycle might there be uh, predators on the, on the parasite itself? Yeah, so I would think that when these metamorphosed females of anchor were release the eggs in the anopheter stages, then those are just planktonic stages that I imagine have predators just like any other kind of plankton out there. So all of your filter feeders, I think, would be feeding on those anopheter stages of Laryngeticus radiatus. And maybe looking at the ecology of this, maybe that's another part of the equation that maybe there's less of those filter feeders or, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, I'm sorry, Mr. Physical, if you talk about what about external factors? I mean, you're downstream of the Hudson River Plume, and all the contaminants coming out of industrial, commercial, residential waste coming out of the harbor. I mean, if you did the same experiment, say, up the coast of Massachusetts and further north, would you see some of these? Or, I mean, that's not known to be very clean water. Yeah, so these were the reef reefs off Barnegat Bay in like the central part of New Jersey. I think that might be a little bit more protected from um, some of the pollution that might be coming from like the lower Hudson, but but not exclusively probably. Uh, so so there there might be something behind that. We did actually look at black sea bass from the Gulf of Maine. So black sea bass are quite abundant here and more recently they've been found in the Gulf of Maine. That's pretty north for their habitat though. They're, they're found in smaller numbers out there. And I looked at parasites, their intensities were very low, um, very low parasite prevalence in the Gulf of Maine fish. That might just be because the abundance is lower out there and that's like the northern part of the range. So I'm not sure how far to look into that. Um, but, but yeah, there could be, we always have to look at contaminants and things as amino modulators that, that keep fish more susceptible to pollution. But at least on those reefs, I would like to maybe rely on some of our biologists now. I thought that those areas were offshore enough and kind of out of the main lower part of the Hudson to be a bit more protected. There is a, the part of the plume. Well, <laughs> there is a lot with, it, with the wind. So. I remember I did some experiments following her just fell years ago. And the plume, pretty much in the absence of wind, it'll go down a narrow strip down the Jersey coast, but the winds are coming up from the south. That whole plume can be pushed offshore deep as far as the south coast of Long Island. So it does move around a lot. Okay, interesting. What kind of contaminants would you suspect? I don't know, I'm not a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Only reason I asked that is because oh, while we were while we were sampling these black sea bass, our office of science does the um, they issue advisories for consumption advisories, so they look at things like PCBs and mercury and everything. I collected samples for them to do that uh, contaminant analysis in them, and they're sitting in my minus 80 freezer yet, so that hasn't been done yet, but they are actually going to look into that. Um, and we got samples from when the black sea bass first moved to the reefs from the continental shelf to midsummer samples and then fall samples when they're like in that area the longest. So maybe some of that will kind of emerge in that work when they do it. What the fishermen do is I see these these fish well, parasites that just throw them back in by hand or I think that the black sea bass they will never know that they have that many parasites because they're like a millimeter to two millimeters. They're found exclusively in the gills, so unless they're opening the gill cavity, um, they're not gonna see it. And the prevalence is so high, so many fish have it that um, I don't think it's very noticeable in the black sea bass. Then the anchor worm in Menhaden is very noticeable, right? Because that's that big worm stage that's hanging off the side of the fish. So uh, my guess is if someone caught one that had a heavy infection, then maybe they're not going to want to fillet it. Maybe they'll want to throw it over. But well, yeah. the question in that video, it all green snow. What is that snow? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have a question from online. Uh, how are the fish still operating so well when the surface area in their gill filaments have been decreased so much due to parasitic infections? And this is from uh, Teresa Lee. Yeah, that's a really good question because their gills appear to be very compromised. Um, surface area is heavily reduced. And I just think it comes down to in a healthy situation, a fish might only need 15 to 20 percent of its gill to. to um, do well in an environment that has high DO when their metabolic scope is low. 
uh, if the DO levels were declined, if these fish were being chased and stressed in any other way, I think that their ability to withstand those stressors is probably going to be reduced. So I think we're looking at decent environmental conditions where they're actually surviving, even though their gills are so covered, and it looks like that they shouldn't be. Like when I look at histology of that gill, I think, oh, this is a diseased fish. It's probably not surviving out there, but that's to the contrary. These fish are actually doing okay out there. So I think that that's it. And a good environment, they can withstand that, but subject to stressors, I think it's a different story. Yeah. I have no second question. Did you look at age um, distribution in the parasite infection on the black sea bass? Because you might just be doing a survival analysis in a sense that 22,000 might be the max and then they start to accumulate mortality. Like you're sampling the ones that are still alive in a sense. We did look at age. So um, parasitism correlates to total length, which can correlate to age. So the heaviest parasite burdens are in the bigger fish that we, we have in there. Um, and that might be related to a couple different factors because we think that the life cycle occurs within like a couple months probably, or at least within one summer. So there's been um, studies done on large fish. So the chemical cues of a larger fish are greater. So parasites can find larger fish better and possibly colonize the gills. So that could be one part of it. But there certainly is an association with um, total length as the fish get bigger, they get a higher parasitism. And with age, we collected odorless samples from every fish we analyzed and they actually got sent out. So we'll have age data for all of them as well. Cool. Yes. Um, so manhaven have typically been going to the Gulf of Maine for quite a while, where uh, these black sea bass are kind of the new climate ingress. And, uh, do you think these increases could potentially be because a huge proportion of the uh, manhaven population is no longer getting the summer off from exposure to sort of? So, like the menhaden are because they're going down south, you mean, or what do you mean? Well, in the summer. A significant proportion of the mid population goes up into you know, Massachusetts Bay. Yeah, yeah. Maine, and, uh, for black sea bass, 20 years ago were extremely rare. So is this like continually increasing spatial overlap? Yeah, that's very possible. And that's a really good point because we are seeing black sea bass more north in their range now. So maybe historically what you're getting at is there's less of an interaction between black sea bass and Manhattan because the Manhattan were up north, black sea bass remain south, and now they're they're kind of more overlapped. I actually didn't think about that. That's a really good point, but maybe that overlap is also creating heavier infections. Um, interestingly, when we looked at black sea bass from the Gulf of Maine, though, we saw very light infections. We didn't see a heavy parasitism there. And again, that might just go down to numbers, but we just have such heavy numbers of both Menhagen and Black Sea Bass here compared to the amounts that are up north. But definitely to your point on like that upward northern um, range expanding of Black Sea Bass, that might change over time. Yeah, yeah good, great point. Yes. I think it would. I think if a menhaden was eaten, I don't think that the parasite survives that. So yeah, definitely increase predation of menhaden if they have those anchor worms on them. That that work hasn't. Yeah, go ahead. I wonder if that could work to sort of limit some of the possible sins on your staying in here and like might have additional predators in this area in those years. Yeah. Or if there's any sort of sub lethal impacts on the methane themselves and the impact of prey on the plant and have them on prey. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. We're definitely seeing more of those marine mammals with these menhaden populations. I think every year we're seeing uh, whales right off New York, which hasn't been seen in the past. So, yeah, great point. Do you have another question from online? How did you find out that the mature female anchor worms were copods? Was it through genetic testing or was it an observation of their metamorphosis through time? Yes, yeah, so we do actually have a, a series of images of the metamorphosis, and those are really cool to look at. Um, so we, we do have that. Um, but there was genetic data already um, for the anchor worm that's Lernianicus radiatus. And 
initially, when we first saw this in black sea bass, we didn't know what the copepod was. And it wasn't until we did the genetics and matched it to the available uh, genetics for anchor worm that we realized that that was just a stage of that parasite, which helped us to kind of figure out the life cycle. I think we are running short on time. So unless someone has a really short question, uh, I think we're going to wrap up this, but there's a uh, tricky pizza outside at the tables and we can have more in-depth conversation with down there. So unless there's any, good. All right. Let's go.